Welcome to Oakwood Presbyterian Church for our morning announcements. The annual meeting will be September 11, 2022, following worship service here in the sanctuary. Following service. To all those preparing for us to the annual meeting, your report should represent what your committee accomplished during 2021. They must be in the film by September 14th. The Tree of Life is still in the narthex for anyone that would like to add their comments, suggestions, or new ideas. Next Sunday is September 4th is Labor Day Sunday and Communion Sunday. The back of the bulletin explains how we will celebrate. The store work day is Wednesday, August 31st, starting at 9 a.m. The thrift store sale day is September 3rd from 9 to 1 p.m. There will be crafters and fellowship all along with Christmas items for sale. Are there any other announcements this morning? And, well, it's not on here because I didn't tell Helen of it. Helen asked about it. That painting, that, or the print that I took in, I'm still waiting for my piece to get cleaned and I will take that print, which is sitting in my guest room in my house, together to the appraiser at the same time. So we haven't forgotten about it. I'm just waiting to do them both at the same time. Thank you. Presbyterian Church. We're going to have a great day today. All the weather people seem to agree. It's just going to be a little hotter, a little more humid, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You see, I'm Italian. I understand what that means. But get out and enjoy the day because it's a, day, a gift from God that he has given to us all and none of us really deserve it, but we have it. So let's take, let's enjoy it 
and take advantage of it. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here at this place at this time. Help us to hear what you have to say to us. Help us by listening to what the words we use, the, the songs we sing, and watching the fellowship that we have so that you can counsel and help us in the quiet times by talking to us, not only in, when we're in this sanctuary, but throughout the weeks and all the weeks to come. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Call to worship. You have come to a community of love and hospitality. Dear God, he treats us to see strangers as angels in disguise. You have come to a community of worship. Here, praising God is more important than pumping ourselves up. Here, you are God's honored guest. Please, please join us in hymn number 225. to have been a hymn a lot longer than it was the alma mater at Ohio State. Well, it reminds me, though, I was watching some of the uh, football yesterday because apparently college football's already started. And there's a big change going on. When you listen to where these players came from, you hear about this so-called transfer portal. People today are such that if they don't if they don't think they're going to progress in, on Team A or Organization A, they just go somewhere else. And they keep moving until they find a place where they're going to make something of themselves. Remember how it used to be that you, that you worked hard and waited your turn, and when your turn came, you did the best you could with it? Well, it doesn't work that way in many cases anymore, which is terribly unfortunate. Well, you see, Team Jesus that we're going to talk about later works a little differently. Every member of it, including each of us, is a member of a team that requires an awful lot of skills and commitments. And it may be that it may take a while for yours to be used. It may take a while. The right situation may come up, and you're the right person to fill it. Believe it or not, you'll know. 
And that's what being a part of Team Jesus is all about. We have a ministry that has a lot of people in it. Imagine if every one of you had exactly the same skills. Think about that. If every one of you had exactly the same skills and all of a sudden the skill that you, none of us has shows up, what would we do? Well, you see, God's a little smarter than that. God has given each one of us the opportunity to practice skills that are unique and different one from another. And in so doing, making the kingdom of God better. We have the thrift store coming up this week. And if you want to see a whole conglomeration of skills, come down if you haven't done it already. And watch the people who are there do what they do. For example, I could not deal with women's clothes. But I can count money. And there are other people that, uh, that love to deal with jewelry. And there's other people that know about housewares. And there's other people that know about kids' games. That's what makes it go. Everybody has a unique interest that they want to pursue and, and uh, use their skills to make better. And that's what any ministry does. And as a result, that's what I'm telling you. No matter how long you're on Team Jesus, it, eventually your skills are going to be called on. And maybe more than once, in fact, likely more than once. So let's all remember that we're all in this together. That it's our ministry that matters, not our individual accomplishments. There's a story about, uh, it, it was told by Dick Trickle, who was the head of uh, the city mission. Are you familiar with the city mission? City mission, uh, you know, there was a day when, when the gentleman came into his office and said, I want to underwrite a homeless shelter. And I want you to run it. And Dick Trickle said, but you know, we have enough homeless shelters. You know what we don't have? We don't have people that are willing to work in them. Why don't you want to do that? Well, the guy got upset and left. He wanted a homeless shelter with his name on it. See, Jesus will use people in the right way. Not, to, not for glory or for whatever, but to further the kingdom. Because really what matters? The glory in this world or the glory we will qualify for through eternal life? I don't think that's a hard question to answer. Praise be to God. Amen. Confession, because that is what the prayer of confession is all about. Let us share it together. God... We come to you today confessing our love of the first chair. The seeds of healthy competition sown in childhood have borne misshapen fruit in adulthood. We love the best seats, bask in recognition, and covet the edge that brings us home. Forgive us, God, when competitiveness yields more pride than excellence. Forgive us, God, when we forget that we work for you, not for ourselves. Forgive us, God, when we forget that humility and hospitality are close relatives, and those who would be your disciples are called to hold hands with the stranger. Make us less eager to fight for power and position, and more willing to make room for those who have neither name nor strength. Amen. My friends, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. In faith you have made humble confession before the living God, who continues to offer us forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the name of Jesus Christ you are all forgiven. Amen. And the people of God say together, Thanks be to God. Again, uh, we're kind of spread out. Uh, if you want to use a loud voice, go ahead. Doesn't matter. We've got a, we've got a big room. <laughs> We got a big room, and uh, I'm glad to see all of you here. Uh, the my our, my goal is to get back to the point where there's more people in here than there is up the street at the golf course, but <laughs> we we got to work on that. Again, thank you all for coming today. Oh, no. no, but I bet your mom is the coach in charge, right? <laughs> uh, she she is coaching you, right? She is giving you lessons and doing. Uh, but you know, 
when you have a coach in charge, I guess, I bet she's the boss. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, right. My mother was too. Uh, coaches tend to be the boss. I'll never forget. Uh, back in the day, uh, I used, to, Linda will tell you, I used to have hair. And when in the 70s, what guys would do is they would cut their hair four times a year. They would cut it to Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, and at the end of the school year. Now, why would you pick those four? Because you're going home, and mom's going to see you. Well, it turns out I was in there to get my Thanksgiving haircut at this barber shop. And there were two young, uh, uh, younger men. Uh, I, was, I was probably 19 or 20. These kids were probably 16. And they're in the chair right next to each other. And there's, there's a barber in each one going in, you know, and all of a sudden they stop. And one turns to the other and says, what do you think? He says, I don't know. Turn us around to see the mirror. So they turn them around to see the mirror. I don't know. Better do some more. So the barber does some more. You know, both of them. Da, 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 da. Stop. What do you think? We better look. So they turn him around to show him the mirror. And he's like, just a little bit more. And finally, they say, they look at each other and they said, Stop now, I th I, we hope it's good enough. I thought that was the, what's going on here? And when these two young men left, I asked the barber, I said, what was all that about? He said, these guys played for the Stephen Decatur High School basketball team. And their coach told them that if they had long hair, they weren't gonna play. So they were trying to decide how short their haircut could be so they can end up playing. Now that's the power a coach has over somebody sometimes. And we're gonna hear about that in our other message. But you know what's funny? Jesus, Team Jesus doesn't care about that. I mean, stop and think. If, if Jesus walked in to a classroom in my high school uh, as, as a public school student or whatever, looking the way he did, he would have been expelled for facial hair and long hair. Okay? But Jesus doesn't care about what you look like. Jesus cares about what you were willing to do. Think about that. We're the most inclusive group in the world. We are... The, type, we, the church is the type of place, they say, that would welcome people that would be thrown out of 90% of all other organizations on earth. Because that's what we're in business for. That's who we are. So it's not a question of what you look like. Uh, I remember, um, my, Linda remembers this guy, General Horace Wolfe who used to come out in the summertime, we all had the you know, coats and ties because that's what we were expected to wear. And he would say, it's a hot day today. We may remove our tunics. And off would come the sport coats. Do you think Jesus really cared whether we wear sport coats or not? The only thing Jesus cares about is that we're there. So think about that in the future. Our ministry should be one of inclusion. It should be one that values each person for who they are. And that's what's important. Not how short or long my hair is. And we're going to hear a story about that shortly. So keep that in mind.
Hear the words of the Lord, O house of Jacob. All of you clans of the house of Israel, this is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me, that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord? Who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and roofs, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. Brought you to a fertile land to eat its rich fruit and rich produce, produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and following were societies. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over <clears throat> to the coast of Kittim and look. Send a key to and observe closely. See if there's anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, O heaven. And shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me. The spring of living water have dug their own cisterns broken sisters that cannot hold water. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, our New Testament lesson is again from the uh, uh, letter to the Hebrews, and it's on page 1265 of the uh, Pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. We're going to be reading chapter 13, verses 1 to 8, and then 15 to 16. Here the word of the Lord is expressed in the letter to the Hebrews. Keep loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are as mistreated if you were yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can any man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way in life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now moving to verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. May uh, God bless the reading of our word this day. That uh, I was once a varsity football player. Yeah. Not a very good one, but I was one. I had one high school coach, a varsity college coach, and a freshman college coach. Now, when you're on the varsity team, you learn that a coach and the players have a much different relationship than most people under, you know, that never have been through this can understand. For some reason, former varsity players remember what their coaches told them more vividly than they remember what some of their teachers told them. I hope I'm not speaking out of school here, but that's tends to be the case. It is a coach that taught us that winning is not everything, but it's the only thing that matters in this business. It's a coach who said there's no I in the word team. It's a coach who said the next man up when somebody got hurt. It was a coach who said that we win as a team and we lose as a team. It was one of my coaches that said to us, you're going to work your tails off anyway, so you might as well win the game. 
Coaches also in my high school and college days had to keep the team decorum. They told us when to practice. They told us for how long. It was the coach who decided whether we needed extra work because we weren't focused on a particular day. There's a story of Herb Brooks with the 1980 Olympic hockey team who kept the team after a game in Norway for two and a half hours until he got the answer to the question he repeatedly asked that he was looking for. Coaches do that. And coaches developed the depth chart and decided when and if you played. It was a coach who decided if you wore a suit when you traveled. It was a coach who dealt with team disputes. It was the coach who set the team rules and disciplined players who broke them. I could tell stories about the way my coaches handled things at George Washington High School for the Minutemen, that's what we were, the Minutemen, or the Millican Big Blue. However, the story of Bill Walton's relationship with Coach John Wooden is a much better story. Any of you remember Bill Walton? Uh, six foot ten, sort of a free spirit, okay? He was recruited out of La Mesa, California to play basketball at UCLA. And he was expected to fill the void when, of all people, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar graduated. So he was going to be the next Kareem. However, Bill's coach was the legendary John Wooden. You played for him, you played by his rules. Never score without acknowledging a teammate. One word of profanity, John Wooden would say, and you're done for the day. Treat your opponent with respect. Then he'd say, discipline yourselves so others won't need to. Never lie, never cheat, never steal. Earn the right to be proud and confident. You know, John Wooden believed in that, at that time, hopelessly out of date stuff that never did anything but win championships. No dribbling behind the back or through, through the legs on his team. There's no need, he'd say. No UCLA number, think about this, was ever retired when John Wooden was the coach. Think of the great players he had. And they asked him why. He said, why would you retire a number for a person? What about all the other players before and since that have worn that number? You're saying they didn't contribute either? No long hair, no facial hair. Now remember, I said Jesus would have, you know, but he has his reasons. He says it takes too long to dry, and you could catch cold leaving the gym. He also felt that it would, you know, it would add to, you know, viruses and things like that. So he had his reasons. Now think about this. How many of you have ever had a coach? Imagine the first practice, the first thing coach does is says, oh, we're all going to sit down, we're all going to learn how to put on our socks. Learn how to put on our socks. After one half an hour of putting the sock on the right foot, Coach Wooden would say, okay, now it's time to learn to put the sock on the left foot. Now you have a classic confrontation in the making. On the one hand was John Wooden with his old-fashioned values. On the other hand was Bill Walton, the kid from La Mesa, the free spirit, as most kids in California, that part of California, wanted to be back then. You know, the surfer crowd and everything. Bill challenged Coach when he sold up at practice with a full beard. And when asked why, he, Bill said, it's my right, he insisted. Coach asked if he believed in that strongly, and Bill said, he did. Coach said, that's good, Bill. I admire people who have strong beliefs and stick to them. I really do. We're going to miss you. You would think that Bill Walton, after shaving his beard, would have an adversarial relationship with his coach. Bill Walton would later write, later write, We thought he was nuts, but all his preachings and teachings, everything he taught us, turned out to be the truth. His interest and goals were to make you the best basketball player, but first, to make you the best person that you could be.
He would never talk about wins and losses, but what we needed to do to succeed in life. Once you were a good human being, you had a good chance to be a good player, and Coach Wooden never deviated from that. He also, Bill Ross also wrote, he never tried to be your best friend. He was your teacher, your coach, and he handled us all with extreme patience. It must have worked because the teams Walton played for and John Wooden coached won 88 straight games and finished two seasons in a row with a record of 30 wins and no losses and won the NCAA championship in both years. So the old school rules, discipline and everything, seemed to lead to success. But that wasn't all. John Wooden cared about his players. Of the 180 players that played for him, just before he died, John Wooden knew where the whereabouts of 172 of them. Of course, it's not hard when most of them called him to check on his health, secretly hoping to hear some of his life lessons so they can write them in the lunch bags for their kids who will roll their eyes when they read, discipline yourselves and others won't need to. Or say, never lie, never cheat, never steal earned the right to be proud and confident. This is the kind of coach we all well wish we had, not only in sports, but just about everything else, right? Clearly the players at UCLA knew the rules and how they were expected to abide by them. John Wooden's players also looked to him for advice and words to live by even after they graduated. Every team has rules. Good teams live by them. The one reason why players remember their coach and sometimes to continue to ask for advice is that those rules meant something to them even after they graduated or retired. Do you ever stop and think that the kingdom of God is very much like a team? We have the best coach that I can think of. That is Jesus himself. He spent a lot of his ministry developing team rules. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Forgive 70 times 7. Now in our text today, the author of the letter of the Hebrews clarifies some of the Gene Jesus rules a little better for us. First thing we read is show hospitality to those that need it. Hospitality was revered in Jesus' day because inns were outrageously expensive and travelers from town to town needed a safe place to stay. Christians often opened their homes to slaves, wandering preachers, and prophets who could not afford to stay anywhere else. Families opened their doors even to very distant relatives when they came to town. Now, how does that translate today? They say good coaches are colorblind. Coach Wooden's teams were diverse and recruits of all weight races were welcome. Our text suggests that our ministry needs to show the same hospitality by, as a ministry, remaining a welcoming team. Our coach Jesus had an open door policy, and he expects us to be the same way. Secondly, the, the author says, show sympathy for those in trouble. Good teams work together to help players who need it. Good coaches find ways to work with players who have the talent but are not achieving. Good coaches awful, often intervene when players struggle in class. The author of the Hebrews goes one step further. Christians today on that day were known for the work that they did to help those in debt and in prison. Christians today have tried their best to do the same, whether it be through food pantries, offering basic material needs, supporting disaster relief efforts, and offering building space sometimes when it was needed. Christians defined the meaning of sowing uh, sympathy back in the first century, and our coach Jesus, who taught us the way, expects us to continue doing it. Thirdly, the author says, live your own life in purity. Despite the commandments that God gave Moses, relationship Commandments became a virtue when Christian church began to grow. Remember that John Wooden said one word of profanity and you're done for the day. Treat your opponent with respect. 
Discipline yourselves so others won't need to. And never lie, never cheat, never steal. Aren't those Christian values? I think so. But not only that, that's what our coach Jesus expects us to do every day. For a Christian, purity should not be a burden, but a way of life. And finally, live your lives in commitment, and contentment rather. Coaches know they can't play everybody on the team. You have 16 players at, at UCLA, and most of them were the best in their area when they were recruited. But you can only play five at a time. So why do you have 16 players? Well, you've got to scrimmage against somebody, and that somebody has to be good enough. You also have to cover injuries and things of that sort. Yet, a good coach does his best to keep everyone contented and focused on winning, not worrying about playing time. We as Christians need to accept the role that God wants us all to play. I don't know what that is, but you do. Not everybody gets to go to places like Guatemala or South, or South Africa, like people in our presbytery have done. Not everyone be, can become a General Assembly Commissioner. We're only allowed two of them every time we have one. Yet Jesus, our coach, wants us to be a part of the team and welcomes any contribution from any of you, regardless whether it's large or small. Giving a cup of coffee to a stranger may seem like being a practice player at UCLA, but guess what? In the end, it matters. Team Jesus needs that as much as the person who goes to Liberia to build a school as one member of our presbytery has done. So each, everything that you do, regardless of how small it is, matters. Then the author of the Hebrews tells us to remember our leaders and imitate their faith. So why did so many of, of uh, John Wooden's players remember the lessons he taught? Perhaps it's because John Wooden admitted that he was a devout Christian and considered his beliefs more important to him than basketball. He wrote, I have always tried to make it clear that basketball is not the ultimate. It is of small importance when we compare it to the total life that we live. There is only one kind of life that truly wins, he tells us, and that is the one that places faith in the hands of the Savior. John Wooden's faith strongly influenced his life. He read his Bible daily and attended the first Christian church. He said that his hope, he hoped his faith would be apparent to others. Listen to what he wrote. If I were ever prosecuted for my religion, I hope there would be enough evidence to truly convict me. Now those are the words of a leader that we all want to follow. Think of it though, John Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood, had a coach that he listened to. And his coach was Jesus Christ, just as our coach is. However, this did not matter unless the players were inspired to live by his rules, to imitate his faith. To D, we Christians have to recognize the leaders that we have. Every good coach has assistants. Jesus Christ, our coach, welcomes assistants to help him. And guess who the assistants are? Us. Remember, we are the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the arms, and the legs of Jesus Christ. We have to remember that, because we'll all use them as part of Team Jesus. Now we're in an election year, we can select our leaders at every level. It's up to us to select people of good character. It's up to us to do it. Our churches elect elders, not only to serve on committees, but to lead and serve the people. The job of all church members is to select people of good character and empower them to lead us in the direction Jesus wants this ministry to go. In short, church leaders are really the assistant coaches for the team, 
that we all know and respect. And guess what? That teaches us how to be assistant coaches when it's our time. Finally, there's a job that a coach must perform that he was soon not to. Despite the best efforts, a player may violate team rules and require discipline. How a coach handles this determines whether their leadership remains effective. Remember, John Wooden stuck to his guns and disciplined his best player, Bill Walton, for having a beard against team rules. He also, remember, Bill Walton said, the coach cannot be the best friend of his players. A good coach is a teacher, a motivator, and a leader. A good coach shows these qualities when they discipline a player. For example, an effective coach will suspend a player for violating team rules and then restate that player once they apologize to the team or show some sign of remorse. Once they do that, they must agree to again accept the team rules and values from that day forward. Remember that Bill Walton said that John Wooden handled every player with extreme patience. Our coach Jesus also treats us with extreme patience. Jesus has to. Look at who he has to work with. The point is that as long as we are part of this ministry, we learn every day, we understand every day, and if we stray a little bit, there's other people in the room that'll help us get back on, on track. We need to ask God for forgiveness, which is like apologizing in front of the team when we do something wrong. We must show remorse for what we may have done. We have to learn to live by the team rules again and learn that if we follow them, we become better team members and in the end, Team Jesus, that's us, will succeed. We remember our coaching telling us that there is no I in team. We also need to remember that Jesus said we need to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and love our neighbors ourselves. We remember our coaches telling us that we win when we lose as a team. We should also remember that Jesus said eternal life comes to those who believe and trust in him. The words of our coaches have motivated us. As Christians, we need to remember the words of our coach, Jesus, and have them inspire us to do great things. Now, any of you uh, familiar with Notre Dame football? If you watch Notre Dame game, there is a, uh, the uh, locker room is above the field, and you go down a set of stairs, and there's a sign at the bottom of one of the stair landings, it says, play like a champion today. And you watch as all the players go by and they jump up and touch that sign to motivate themselves, whether they're starters or, or substitutes, to play like a champion today. Well, I thought about that, and I made up a sign for our church. It says, be a Christian today. Now I'm going to put that on the back door. So hopefully when we leave today, we can touch the sign and that will motivate us to be a part of Team Jesus, at least for today. This will allow, this will allow us to contribute to Team Jesus the way our coach wants us to. That will make the world a better place. Praise be to God. Amen.
volunteer and help us out because that's that's an important way we keep our ministry going but more importantly it's a fellowship at the same time that's the funny thing about ties talent and treasure time you know time talent treasure sometimes you get benefits from it that you don't expect sometimes you get to get come together on a Saturday morning and all of a sudden, it's Saturday afternoon. And you've dealt with all kinds of different people and you've, you've watched people go through things and find stuff they've been looking for for a long time. When you're doing through all of that, I'll bet not one of you thinks that, gee, the reason we're doing this is to maintain the church. The reason we're doing this is because we're called to do it. And at the same time, it, it makes the ministry grow. And that's what using your time, talents, and treasury is all about. As I said earlier, each one of us has a talent. And it may be a while before it's called to be used. But when it is called, let's hope each one of us can properly respond. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you through uh, time, talents, and treasury. Let us continue to serve you in the coming days. Be with those for the thrift store and be with those who serve in many other ways. Help us to use the gifts that you have given you to focus them on making our ministry grow and become more effective and also to touch the community to make it a better place. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. has tested positive for COVID and is going through the uh, quarantine protocol. So keep her in your prayers. Uh, Jenny is home now. Or? Oh, but she's not doing very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Pauline Brown's doctor visit went 
as she put it, okay, although it's the old watch your sugar, you, know, you, you keep your diet and exercise. So, you know, those of you who know her might want to follow up with her. Uh, Kenny, how are you doing? got uh, uh, Barbara, how's um, He's just getting treatment to stop the cancer from growing. Okay. And also, uh, uh, where is she? Uh, your neighbor, Eileen. Understand that uh, it's uh, it's you know I guess I guess the treatment itself is more tiring than anything. So we have a whole list of folks that we have been praying for and continue to pray for. The good news with Tony Keel is he's going to be going for uh, for uh, therapy. He keeps telling us that when he gets rid of that walker, he's coming back here. So let's hope the therapy leads leads him in that direction. Uh, any word from uh, Fatona or? As far as I know, she's, she's still hanging in there. She's doing what she's supposed to do. Well, that's good, because uh, there are, there are uh, a lot of people who don't listen to their doctor. <laughs> so I'm glad she's the one who does. Are there any other concerns that we should bring forward today? If not, let's, excuse me. Any others? Okay, let us share our prayers uh, for people this morning. Lord God, creator and sustainer of all things large and small, we thank you for your love and caring that you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you for giving us your son Jesus who taught us how to pray and inspired us to continue seeking and striving for ways to further your kingdom here on earth. We thank you for the author of the Hebrews who reminded us that being followers of Jesus Christ requires both discipline and commitment and will result in a better world for everyone. Lord God, we continue to struggle our way through the COVID-19 pandemic. Be with our sister Pam who is currently recovering from this disease. Help us all to continue to take proper precautions and to recognize any special requirements that may be posted in places we might frequent so that we can help slow the pace of this disease. At the same time, help us to deal with the more recent health concerns with the same discipline and respect as we have shown for COVID-19. Lord, violence continues to dominate the headlines. We continue to look for ways to de-escalate the conflict in the Ukraine. At the same time, help our leaders diffuse tensions between China and Taiwan. Closer to home, we continue to see more senseless violence. Help us to determine common sense solutions to our domestic disputes so that violence is not always the first response. Help us to recognize cases where people become dangerous to themselves or others and to take action to defuse potential senseless violence. Lord, several of your children are experiencing periods of pain or distress or have simply lost their way. Today we offer special prayers for Kenny who is having surgery this week and Michelle who is having surgery this week. We also offer special prayers for Tony who will be starting physical therapy and for Darlene who is recovering from a virus and for Pauline, who is beginning a regimen of sugar-watching, diet, and exercise. We offer continued prayers for Becky's sister, Jenny, Barbara, Linda, Eileen, Lois, 
Heidi and Fatona. You have known these people since before they were born. You know of their plights on this very day. We ask that you provide the guidance and healing that you know that they need. Help us to remember that we are to be your ambassadors of hope and love, not only for the people that we know, but for anyone you would lead us to. Lord God, we pray for this church and its ministry. We thank you for the opportunity to continue to meet in this place, to worship and praise you. Help us as we open the thrift store this week, and help us to open the doors of the community at the same time. Listen to us as we speak to you through our prayers, and help us to listen to you when you speak to us during the quiet times. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. a couple of reminders. First of all, uh, when we leave the church, uh, during the week especially, uh, make sure that the doors you use are locked when you leave. Uh, that's, that's, that's very important, especially, in, especially during the week, and if you're the last people to leave on Sundays. Next week is Labor Sunday, and you're going to find out next week that, that God values a working person. So, I'm asking everybody to bring in something or maybe to wear something that tells the world what you did for a living. Because that's how we find out about each other, who we are and what we're about. And that may indicate some talents that some people have that we might be able to use as a ministry. You never know. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and every day to come. Amen.
Thank you.